Martin, and we are going to start now with the um, discussion of the Stun Arjun draft that went through a round of uh, ISG review. All right. Ready to go? Okay, I'm, I'm in the box here, so I'm ready to go. Okay, very interesting room arrangement here. Uh, hi, so I'm, I'm Alan Johnson. I'm gonna talk about Stun Origin on behalf of the uh, other co-authors. And I think only Justin is here, and I don't spot him in the room, so. Okay, uh, next slide, please. Uh, so basically the draft uh, completed, last call, and uh, went up in front of the IESG. Um, and there are three discusses against it, which, uh, which we'll go through. And um, also, uh, basically the co-authors, we have, we've not uh, come to consensus on what's the best approach to, to work through those discusses. So, uh, so this presentation is really just about bringing you up to speed on that and um, hopefully getting some feedback and maybe some new ideas from the group. Okay, so three three discusses. Uh, first was uh, was Barry's, and these these weren't too major. Um, he questioned about our must and shoulds, and in particular about empty origins. Um, he he wanted to explain more about the should not for ice and uh, and, and other usages, and he had a question that was some there was some leftover text about multiple origins. Um, we we basically resolved these. Uh, this particular discuss just through email exchange. So, so not a big deal with this one. Uh, next. Right, so Stevens discuss. Um, basically is a, uh, say privacy uh, and trade-offs uh, discuss on it at a, at a very high level. And uh, basically just arguing that, uh, that the pluses weren't worth the, uh, the, the uh, you know, privacy leakage. And the fact that uh, that if uh, if we had this extension and we used it the way we described in the draft, that we would be generating a whole new set of metadata uh, that would be in stun and turn servers out there that does that does not exist today. Um, and uh, uh, and in particular, the um, one of the use cases he he really pushed on was the was the realm selection for the uh, for the multi-tenanted turn server. Uh, and, and that was that was actually one of my top use cases for it. In the process of that discussion, we actually discovered that we kind of don't need this anyway. That it turns out WebRTC kind of ignores the the realm anyway. Um, so so apparently we can do multi-tenanted uh, turn servers uh, even without this. Um, so that that was kind of interesting to learn. Um, and you know we had a lot of discussion. We we uh, some of us you know listened in to the to the actual telechat, which was a great a, a great tool. I'm really glad that, that we can do that these days. Um, and uh, also we had a we had an informal conversation. I think it was the following week where where we got to interact. Um, and uh, and we had a ton of interaction among the uh, among the co-authors. And we brought in Oleg, who who as you probably know is uh, as his. Uh, Turn server out there where he had running code for all this, and um, I don't know. My my personal take on this is that is that Stephen is probably right that there that there really is a lot of metadata being generated here, and uh, and and that we need to come up with some other some other way of of solving these problems. Um, but again, that that's my personal opinion. Some of the some of the other co-authors were still still unconvinced on this. Uh, next slide. And then finally, uh, Alyssa's discuss um, basically supporting Stevens on the on the privacy front. Um, and she's also concerned about clients lying about the origin, um, but that's that's not really a big deal. Um, and argued that logging is not a sufficient justification because we had planned to put it in uh, in basically stun queries, and uh, you know really logging and knowing who's using your service. Um, is is really the only justification for that one, and you know, is that is that worth the privacy leakage, and the new metadata that's generated? Um, 
So my, my personal feeling is that it is probably not. And, you know, even, even without uh, Ed Snowden talking to us on, uh, on Sunday night about the dangers of metadata, um, you know, I, I had already come around to that, to that conclusion. Uh, so next slide, please. So we've had a lot of discussion among the, among the authors. Um, and uh, so far, we have not come to a consensus. But I'll, I'll share with you some of the approaches that we talked about. Um, one was to only share the origin when the stun turn URI domain matched the domain of the, or, of the um, origin itself. So in other words, you only share the origin with your own, your own uh, stun and turn server. So I mean, that, that provides some, some level of logging that makes sense. Um, but it also means that, that you, you would, um, uh, if you're using someone else's stun and turn server, there would be no, no logging information. You, there basically wouldn't be any origin. Um, another alternative was to make origin opt-in only. So it would be basically turned off by default and could be uh, turned on uh, by users or perhaps by an administrator to say that, you know, everyone in this domain or everyone using the approved web browser would, would opt into this and, uh, and, and would basically share this information. Um, and then the, the final one, which, which is my personal favorite, um, is to think about maybe uh, making origin an extension to, to return so that it would, it would effectively only be sent to a, uh, to a border turn proxy. Um, and this, this allows you to, to certainly keep track of who is using that, but it also allows uh, that, particular, uh, that particular border element to have this information and use it for, uh, for admission type policy decisions, right? So you know, uh, based on the turn credential, you know who is, um, who is trying to use WebRTC and you know from origin what particular WebRTC application they're planning to use. And based on that, you can uh, allow or disallow their, their use of WebRTC. So, so that's, uh, that's one possible way. But anyway, th those were the only ones that, that we had come up with. So, uh, so basically, it'd be good to get some feedback and see if we can maybe generate some more, or see, if, see if folks think these make sense. So, so Alan, uh, Colin Jenks. Um, Alan, this is just a, qu a clarifying question about how the last one works. Um, to, to address the, the concerns raised in, in the thing, I mean, if, it if somebody deployed something that looked like a border turn proxy, but wasn't, it was really, really up in the web run by the same people as the turn proxy right after it, um, it's not clear to me that the how we'd stop this from just degenerating to effectively the same case that was the first one. I imagine I'm just confused, but maybe you can walk sure. me through that. Yeah, th no, that, that would be a problem. If, if anybody could impersonate a, a border turn proxy, then, then, that, then, then this wouldn't have any benefit, as you say. But I think in order to be a border turn proxy, you have to actually, you know, top topologically, you need to be in the right place and you need to. But that's not something the browser necessarily can figure out is whether someone's topologically in the right place before they send it. Recollection is that the, it's based on the method of discovering the turn server, right? You, you get your application turn servers from the JavaScript, and that's essentially right. untrusted. But you get your you, you get your return servers from from whatever the appropriate appropriately appropriately secured uh, discovery mechanism is, right? Whether we decide that's you know MDNS or multicast, right. or, or whether it's just manual provisioning. I see. So so basically, as, as, so yeah, as, as long as no one can impersonate a, a, a return turn server. Right, so it's the discovery mechanism that tells the browser this is one you're allowed to send the origin to versus one that came through the JavaScript. Correct. Yep. That's the intent anyway. We would obviously need to make sure that that really does work with, with, with return. Uh, Brandon Williams, Akamai. Um, for, for the last one, uh, extension to return, if if the origin is being used for policy decisions as opposed to selecting the realm that you're going to authenticate against, um, it seems to me that we get back into a position where Alyssa's um, question about the benefit of lying becomes um, particularly relevant. It ends up being a trivial way to, lying ends up being a trivial way to get around uh, the policy decision making uh, element. So I'm not sure that it's uh, actually something that can be used in an effective way there, at least without some further uh, specification around 
how do you prevent that? Um, and while I don't think necessarily that the origin uh, attribute uh, is necessary for the purpose of um, differentiation on a third party turn service, um, it's definitely the, the thing that I've been looking at because it was convenient and that was kind of the way that it was framed uh, for a third party turn service that maybe isn't being used um, uh, specifically for WebRTC and or maybe where the origin isn't, uh, isn't being used to specify a realm, but rather on the third party service and in the context of third party auth being used to figure out which set of credentials you have to use to authenticate, uh, to, to handle the uh, access token. And under those circumstances, I, I, I definitely wouldn't be opposed to the origin not showing up until you're actually providing uh, the third party auth token or, or something in that regard. Or, and I wouldn't be opposed to some completely different mechanism being called out as this is how you differentiate, you know, if that needed to, if that needed to be actually directly in uh, the access, uh, the auth token somehow, um, that would be fine as well. But I, I think I was eyeing the origin is that thing that would be used for differentiation. Therefore, it's not part of the third party auth um, that we've already got <laughs> um, through the process. So I think that's something that we need to think about in that context. Yeah, so I, actually, that, that's a good question because we did discuss among ourselves whether whether Origin was any use in the third party auth, and we we concluded that it wasn't. But if you think that's not the case, then that that would be a very good piece of information. Did did you have some idea of an alternative mechanism for differentiating distinct customers of a third party turn service that's really only providing the relay capability and not the full application flow somehow? Yeah, I, th I think we assume that, that that whatever equivalent realm information would be in the, in the third party authorization token, right? And so all the information you need would be encoded in that somewhere. And, and that you didn't have this need to provide the realm ahead of time. Yeah, I mean, just new writing. Like specifically, like if you contact the web server to get the token, like the origin can be presented there. You find out, and and then the, the actual web server that's presented a token can actually make the decision as to whether or not to grant access. If he can give you a token in the first place, and that turn server doesn't have to have any smarts. The turn server just says, "Do I have a token? Yes or no." Yeah. Brandon Williams again. Um, it it's really the question of because there are shared credentials involved. Um, each individual customer of a third party uh, uh, relay service will necessarily need to have their own uh, credentials. And so it's really just a matter of ensuring that uh, you can determine which credential set to use and therefore, and, and that kind of goes along with the customer. So it's gotta be there somehow if the third party service is what's responsible for generating the keys and therefore the key identifiers, then you can get that information out of the key identifiers. Um, in, in at least one model that, that I've uh, discussed with the authors of the third party auth draft, it wouldn't be the relay server service that was responsible for the key IDs and therefore there, there wouldn't be that centralized system that would be uh, that would be able to ensure the uniqueness of the key IDs and therefore suitability for the purpose of customer identification. I think it might be making it too complicated. I think that when you come to the web server, you can identify what domain, you know, what set of credentials you want to use, what ROM you're using when you contact this the author the AS, and then they can just decide whether or not to grant you a token, yes or no. So uh, I mean, it, it, it's really it, it's really just a matter and, and we we probably should take this offline because it's not entirely relevant discussion for the origin draft. Um, but it, it, it's really the matter of how does, how does the turn server decide which of the keys that are shared with the auth um, authentication service to use to authenticate and decrypt. Um, so it's not, it's not about the access per se, just how do I deal with the token? Which keys do I use? So, so I was actually going to speak roughly to the same thing, which is, I, I mean, 
we have multiple people generating the keys and this allows us to know which one of the key servers to authenticate the token with right? or you know check that the token's valid with um, so I think that when I thought about the the use cases that I, that I, that I care about deeply um, the first option you have here where they may need to be the same um, that would definitely uh, meet the use cases that, that I can think of right now. I think that would work really well for us. So I think that that's, that's my leaning right now. Okay. Yeah, I kind of like that one too. But yeah, Justin Bray, one, one of the problems with the first one is just that origins are full origins. Like, you know, foo.google.com is not the same as bar.google.com. And so we'll get into an interesting question of how do you know if something matches? Um, does turn.google.com match www.google.com? Like we would have to go to find some sort of matching function, and it's not clear exactly how you know how that would be specified. Right. I was sort of imagining something like, um, it, you know, that uh, that would that basically it would be an SRV lookup of foo.google.com exactly for turn is what and whatever, and then you follow that SRV process, which may actually point to another DNS record that points to the final thing. So you can still have indirection here, but if you were a whitelist provider providing, you know, several different, you're, you're providing, you know, uh, mozilla.hangouts.com was the example I was using earlier. You'd need a, a CNAME record for mozilla.hangouts.com and an SRV record for turn for that same thing. Uh, and that's how the matching was working. That, that's, what I, that's what I was imagining, is something roughly along those lines. Uh, John Lennox, um, I'm standing up to completely redesign this at the mic. But um, if, so we all. Yeah, um, <laughs> if this were not the equivalent of the HTTP origin header, but instead the equivalent of the HTTP host header, would it solve your problem? I mean, because basically, if, you, if the guy knows which what was the input to the SRV lookup that caused you to reach me? Would that solve all the which which round do I present problems without having the same kind of privacy? Because basically all you're saying is, hey, this, you know, basically, I'm, hey, I looked up this your this name in DNS and got your address, which is not, which I mean, anybody, which is not particularly, I mean, it's maybe a little bit exposed, but it's not hugely exposed, not to the same extent. Um, would that solve the use cases? I don't know. I'd have to think about that some more. What do you think, Justin? Justin, you ready? I mean, I think this would be this. It would have the same issues that Stephen brought up. Is that it would indicate to the turn server provider which applications are using the turn server because it would be Mozilla Hangouts to com or, or or whatever would be actually provided in that host header. And so I feel like we're kind of like being impaled on a dilemma here where uh, we want to try to find like what's really useful for this. And I feel like, you know, the only use it when it matches is, is probably you know, so pigeonholed to not be that generally useful. But like, you know, the other way sort of is running afoul of the general move in the ITF to not be including this metadata in, in things that don't have to have it. And I think when we talk about the return application, I'd be interested in getting a sense of like, is this also doomed? Because I generally get the sense that proxies um, are trying to be kept in the dark as much as possible going forward. That even things like SNI that proxies are using to like, you know, look at traffic and see like where is a, a client actually going, um, that's being hidden in like TLS 1.3. And so like if we start including information that proxies, like a return proxy is going to be acting on, like this origin header, is this going to kind of be going upstream? So that would be a good thing to get a sense for uh, before we really start doing any serious work on this path. Yeah, I, I definitely agree. Uh, Patrick Linsky. So this, um, this the, the problem with uh, uh, dash one um, is is uh, um, the the thing the thing that strikes out as being annoying about dash one is that you only have one origin so server to list. There's a, there's you have a, a single origin server value. Um, this is a problem that comes up kind of again and again and again in different parts of the HTTP uh, uh, kind of security world um, of like wanting to, at the application level, wanting to be able to treat kind of a collection of servers, of, of domain names as part of your kind of trust domain. Um, but origin is a single value. Um, I can imagine doing something where we use a different header that's like a, you know, turn origins header that allows you to specify a list rather than a single value. But I also wonder whether or not this is something we should be looking at kind of at the cores 
or HSTS level for just making the, uh, you know, rather than having a singular here, being able to specify a plural so that, so that the applications can have more control over their deployment topology uh, um, and still maintain uh, uh, acceptable levels of security. So, and, th and this, might, this is almost certainly not the right forum for that, but I don't know what would be. <laughs> Alyssa Cooper. Um, so just to to Justin's point, um, I th I think I think that's right. I think it's sort of like by comparison to what's what was originally specified in the draft, the bordered proxy thing looks better, but by comparison to option one, it doesn't really right. Like it's so, <laughs> um, and I think it it will be sort of evaluated in the, in the broad and not just by comparison to like, oh, well, it's not nearly as bad as just sharing this with every turn server, but I, I think you're gonna run into the same issue with the third option. So um, I'm, I'm liking the first option from the point of view of how, where, where I wrote the discuss. Okay, so, yeah, I mean, the, the first option doesn't leak any metadata because if it's your application and your turn server, then you know that you're exactly. using it. Yeah. So you're not generating any new, new metadata, so. Right, depending on exactly how we define the matching function, of course. Yeah, yeah. You, you would, yeah, we, we do need to think about that. But if you just go with the bottom, you know, the, the bottom level domain. Right, but I mean, <laughs> like in all contexts, that may not be appropriate, right? I mean, like you're going to use your hosted content, you know, on like some subdomain or something. So that's where I feel like you spend a lot of time trying to solve what could be a very squishy problem. But uh, yeah, right. So unless I just on your on your comment, like um, you know, the whole rationale behind doing this in return was that enterprises might want to have an ability to say for a web application A, they want to allow the web application, but not allow WebRTC traffic for that uh, particular application. And so instead of blocking it, you know, at the firewall of just the overall HTTP access to that URL, they're going to just sort of block WebRTC for that URL. And so, like, that was the idea behind, like, doing this in return. But, like, from the standpoint of, like, the ITF, you know, is that type of behavior something we did not explicitly want to be promoting? I don't have a good answer to that, honestly. I have to, I would, I need to look at, at return more. Um, so, sorry. Okay. <laughs> but can I ask you a question, though, about the um, the sort of drilling down to the, the broadest domain like does it does it give you a does it help you to be to be able to do the most lenient match on the domain or you're just saying that there's like there's some we have to decide how you're going to how you're going to match domains but it doesn't really give you more information that is useful one way or the other so this is just again trying to restrict what entities have access to the actual origin header and so we could say like the most strict match where like only like the full subdomain you know, actually, only if those match, the, does it actually work? And then your turn server basically has to be co-located with like your web server, and then it's like practically useless. So like that's the extreme case. And so the other case is like if you go all the way down to like just like the bare domain, now you might be exposing this information when like you know uh, App Engine or whatever, like you're running like foo.appspot.com. Now if you have some turn server appspot.com, any App Engine app now is disclosing their um, you know their usage to your turn server. And so like that might be overly broad. And so trying to find some place along this continuum of like way too specific or way too broad may be hard to like, you know, incorporate into a regex. Yeah. You need some that's what I was gonna say. Yeah, this is suddenly you need you need debound. You need you need the debound solution to basically tell you what to do. What is debound? The domain boundary, the oh, domain okay. boundary stuff. Yeah. That's the work group you're referring to. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> just one, one reply, just, I mean, we, even if we have the full matches, we don't need to be hosting those things on the same servers at all, right? I mean, the, it's two D, different DNS. I mean, even if we fully match the domain, the web server and the stun server can be on totally different machines. So it's not, I, I mean, I would totally agree if they had to be the same machine, it'd be totally useless, right? Because you never want to run your turn server on your same yeah, as place long as you're not using A records, then you can you can have them somewhere else. Yeah, I mean, assuming you're using SRV records or or mm -hmm. something, or or if people want to use A records, I wouldn't care if we said if you add you know underscore <laughs> I really mean turn dot to the domain name it matches or some predefined things that was very clear. But I mean, 
I think we already have that with SRV. I mean, I mean there, there's definitely some way to do it. The question is like now you're starting to give like restrictions on how people can actually deploy their applications and still you know make. Well, I'm saying they have to use SRV records would be my my proposal and full match. I mean that look like all I'm saying is that would totally work for me if someone's got something more flexible way than that. Sure, um, sure. Yeah. I mean, I, I just think if we, anytime we put certain sort of restrictions on this, we need to sort of step back and evaluate, are we now providing a real value with right. this? You know, and like, you know, if, if it's not, we should just kind of accept it and move on. Yeah, and I think even with SRV records, though, it allows us to totally run our web servers and turn servers on different machines, hosts. That's all I and, want to say. Uh, Colin, one question for you before we walk off. Do, do you have a new use case for, for Origin? Or, or is it yes, and I'm presenting it later today if we finish on time. <laughs> Maybe you can give us a 30-second. Um, I, for uh, enterprise firewalls, they often block UDP to today. And one of the things that they often look at to allow other things is effectively the origin information to allow it through. And they've requested, hey, could we send this origin information uh, through as one of the things that the firewall could use for okaying this connection? And that's, that's my basic use case for it. Um, all of those solutions at some level uh, work for it. Um, I just prefer the, the first one because I think it's got better privacy than the second one. It'll be more actually usable. Um, and I prefer it to the third one because we'd have to sort of de deploy these double fakes, turn servers mm, to okay, sort of yeah. do something that we weren't really supposed to be doing to, to achieve it. So I think the first one is the best. Okay. Uh, um, Brent, I, uh, Brendan Williams, um, I, I, think, um, I think what we fundamentally need to do is, is look back at the look back at the use cases um, and identify specific use cases where we think it actually could bring value and um, who we have to be prepared to leak the data to in order to provide that value. So for example, in the firewall case, you have to be prepared to leak the data to anybody who is in a position to view the traffic when it goes by. You can't apply DTLS um, uh, to uh, the uh, to the turn tunnel, for example, if you want to be able to use it, you'd have to use you know, SNI or um, LPN uh, in that context. So, what are what are specific use cases that where we actually think it can provide value, and who would we have to be willing to leak the data to, and do do we actually have the capability for those use cases to narrow it down? specifically to just those use cases and ensure in a reasonable way in the applications that it's going to be possible to determine when you need it and when you don't. I think if we're able to narrow down the exposure as much as possible and ensure that it's only being used in cases where it actually brings value and where we can describe clearly what the value is, then we've satisfied the requirements of the um, pervasive monitoring draft because we've actually looked at it and mitigated as much as possible. If we can't answer those questions, then you know, it's, it's going to be a persistent problem for us. Right. Uh, so to Cullen's point about, uh, Patrick Linsky, uh, to Cullen's point about um, um, SRV records, um, one, of the, one of the downsides with SRV records is that um, many applications can't uh, many application deployment environments don't provide the application deployer with the ability to configure uh, SRV records. Um, on the other on the other hand, one of the advantages is is you know just that that SRV records are outside of the uh, um, you know outside of the envelope, so uh, would would be uh, accessible in, in in a broader spectrum. Okay, so I guess based on this feedback, we'll get some discussion going on the list. And um, see if we can't can't unblock the draft here. Yep. Thank you very no, much. No magic bullet here, unfortunately. Nope, I don't think so. Is there anything useful to be done in making a decision? You. I'm sorry. You, you think you can? You think we can make a decision now. Options or. <laughs> um. Because I think that this is such a difficult topic and we'll be discussing it in four months from now, I think it would be nice to see if we could, if, if we uh, obviously have to be confirmed on the list and any one of these ideas we may discuss on the list, we may, everyone in the room may say that's rocking perfect and a week from now somebody may see big problems with it. But I'd sort of like to get a, if there, see if there's a sense of the room on these three anyway. All right. Yeah, we can hum. Sure. Um, 
You want to say something, Spencer? Okay. Um, those who think the first dash bullet there is, um, yeah, bullet X is the uh, solution to be investigated, and the others are all, we should drop them, okay? So I'm going to ask for each of them. If you think bullet one should be investigated and we should drop bullets two and three, please hum now. Same for bullet two, please hum now. Same for bullet three, please hum now. People who don't have an opinion, please hum now. Okay. For the night taker. I actually have a different opinion. <laughs> okay, so there were, I mean, several people for the first one, nobody from the second, probably one or two persons for the third, and several people for the fourth. And, and uh, my opinion was that we should look at the first and the third and not the second. So it might be useful to see if we were willing yeah, to. Yeah, no, I, it was intentional. I No, we're only going to pursue one. One of them. <laughs> because otherwise we're not making a decision, right? <laughs> yeah. So I mean, you you have enough idea of you know how to start investigating. So we we can we can move on. Uh, Spencer, please. So uh, Spencer, as the responsible lady, so I'm I should be expecting this draft will be back in the working group, and I should, but I am expecting to see it at some point. If, if the investigations work out right, am I get they get that right? Yeah. So so basically, um, I don't know if you, you have to do some magic in the data tracker, but basically, yeah, the draft is in the working group again, and you may see it back if if we reach consensus and and we do something useful. Oh. But uh, don't hold your breath. So we'll <laughs> we'll keep you updated. So the the token is with us basically. Uh, I, I'm I'm actually starting to work out, so I should be able to hold my breath longer soon. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Uh, but that, but but that's not permission for you guys to do anything. Uh, but but uh, but but thank you. So like I said, I'll, I mean, just, I'll, I'll just, figure out what the what the plan is in the data tracker. Yes, but I didn't want token, you guys to freak out. Exactly. To the chairs or the working group, but uh, however it works now yeah. nowadays, and uh, and we'll take it from there. Thank you. Thank you, Spencer. Thank you, Alan. I can leave the box now. <laughs> you, you may leave the box. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Turn light is next. You're in the box now. Don't <laughs> don't leave until we we say you can leave. <laughs> uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Bin Liu. Uh, actually, this draft had been uh, uh, presented in Honolulu once, and uh, after that. Uh, based on the feedback uh, online, online, we revised this. Uh, so if you forgot, have forgotten the specific content, it's okay. You can just consider it as a new new proposal. Next, please. Um, this is a motivation why we uh, proposed a a new architecture, um, given that uh, the turn is already uh, on the way. Uh, we've been exploring that uh, the service providers, they might would like to uh, provide uh, turn relay service to their customers. And uh, for many, um, service providers, they already have uh, many infrastructures such as uh, CGN or CDN deployed in their network. So they want to use, reuse these infrastructures to provide uh, data relay services. And uh, they don't want to change too much on these existing devices. And when, uh, when we uh, explore the uh, turn solution, we found that uh, 
um, it was a bit complex to fulfill the uh, motivation. Uh, each CGN needs to reserve uh, and plan address port uh, resources. And especially considering the CGNs are widely distributed in the network, it, it uh, should be a very uh, burden work. And the signaling is a bit uh, complex. It's ICE based and uh, uh, we have different procedures for different uh, requirements such as uh, UDP, TCP, and uh, IPv4, IPv6 communication. So the CGN devices might be difficult to directly support uh, these function functionalities. Uh, that's our uh, impression of uh, utilized current turn solution to, to the uh, intended scenarios. Next, please. <coughs> so this is the uh, new architecture. We called it as turn light. As you can see in the dotted line frame, it's the SP's domain. And in contrast to the SP domain, it's the uh, application provider domain. So there are three uh, key components in the Turnlight architecture. One is a relay selection, as you can see in the box, and uh, the data relay, mostly VR CGN devices, and of course the client. And next, please. Uh, this is a, a brief uh, demonstration of how this architecture can work. The first step is that uh, the clients uh, register to their application server so that they can get the relay, uh, relay selector address. And they can also get the ref reflex address and of the uh, release selector. And then the client reports the addresses to the application server. In the second step, the application server send the uh, reflex address pairs to the release selector. And based on these addresses, the release selector can uh, choose a proper uh, relay device so yeah. let me stop you there for a second. Um, I, I think I mentioned this in the previous uh, ITF. I, does the application provider then have to know about all the service providers so it can contact their RS? Um, the, yeah, yeah, yeah. All the application providers need to know the release selector. So I feel like that's like a fatal flaw in this design. Like I don't think there's any way that you know, like WhatsApp or somebody is going to set up a relationship with every single service provider in the world so that they can like make this work. Like I think that it would be better to try to figure out how could we adapt turn to work better on these CGN devices that we have we don't want to make a lot of changes to than trying to change how applications work where the actual application provider has to know about every single service provider in existence. Yeah, but uh, yes, this is the, um, the decent way of the current solution. Uh, but uh, uh, in another perspective that, uh, for example, one SP, they want to enable such kind of services to their uh, customers. They can deliver it as a um, added value service and uh, application servers can buy the service. So in this context, um, it's not uh, difficult or a big burden for the application providers to uh, contact with directly with the uh, 
You I see. Use electric device. So this is for certain types of applications that are well known to the service provider. Uh, sorry. Th this is for a certain subclass, certain subtype of applications that somehow already have a relationship with the service providers. Yeah. yeah. I mean, generally, this is basically saying throw turn and ice and all that out the window. Um, and it, it basically replaces this with a new sort of uh, connectivity method based around this, this couple uh, command. Um, that's a pretty big suggested change. <laughs> yeah, I understand. Yep. Uh, yeah, I, I can understand if you feel this is uh, strange or a bit out of the distant track of our working group, but uh, uh, we really expect you to consider in the specific context that uh, uh, the, uh, the SP want to utilize their existing infrastructure to provide these, this kind of value added services to their customers. So under this specific context, um, we we want to know you do you think it's potentially a useful work or, or, or not? I think if there was a way that you could, you know, do a reduced complexity version of turn that worked on CGN that didn't change the other parts of the stack like ice and that sort of thing, and like where the clients didn't have to change, um, that could probably get some traction. But I think you're basically establishing a parallel universe here that does things differently than how turn and ice have already been sort of specced and uh, identified here in the ITF. And I think it's very hard, given that, to sort of say, let's go do this separate solution. Uh, it's hard to even argue that this is actually in scope for the tram charter, given that it's not really turn light. It's like something else that's really totally different than turn. So I mean, I'd be happy to sort of talk about how we could try to make turn fit your situation, but I think creating something that's like this parallel universe thing is unlikely to like get a lot of support. Others may disagree, but that's my my perspective. Thanks, um, Mark Petulina. I really would like to understand what is so complex in turn that it cannot run on CGN. This this is the thing we should start with, in my opinion. What what really is complex there? Um, okay, I, I can, uh, sorry. <laughs> yeah, I need a slice, thank you. Uh, could you do the next slide? Okay, this is a, a brief comparison between turn and uh, turn light. And as you can see, for the relay address allocation, uh, the turn light uh, doesn't need different addresses for the client. It just needs uh, one relay address for uh, for the uh, under one relay. And uh, the, for the data relay, uh, the, six, the signaling is uh, much more uh, easier um, because uh, in turn solution, it needs eight steps for the interaction. In the turn net, it only needs uh, two steps, meaning uh, regarding to the couple operation. And uh, for the release election, um, the turn light, turn light solution can be done by the release elector, which is a central um, entity owned by the SP, such as a kind of uh, controller or, or something, uh, so that it might be easier for the SP to choose a better uh, relay. Two minutes left. I, I guess, Eric Rascorla, I'm confused. If the relay selector makes a decision based on the 
um, based on the client's reflexive address, why don't you just do that in DNS? Why don't you provide a DNS address for the, re for, for the, for the term server and do dynamic DNS? Um, sorry, I, I'm not able to <laughs> so, answer your question. So can you, go back to, can you go back to the diagram, please, that shows how this works? Yes. Um, so the, um, the, the client connects to the app provider. The app provider talks to the relay selector. Mm -hmm. And at some point, the relay selector hands the, um, the, 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 so the, the relay selector hands the, um, the client um, a term server based on the um, relay selector, based on the client's reflexive address, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So why don't you, so why don't you, instead of having the app provider and this, and, and this back and forth, why don't you have the relay selector coupled to the DNS DNS server and have the client provided a DNS um, name for the term server and then the relay selector just looks at the at the request in the client's in the client's request and like and figures it out from there. But uh... and that won't give you everything, but it'll give you pretty close because most people use Ruse resolvers which are close to them. All right, um, time's over for this presentation. Uh, I think you've received feedback, um, and I think you will have to, uh, if you want to continue with this, you will have to up, uh, uh, do a significant update of your draft. Okay, okay, thanks for your comments. Thank you. Next one is uh, WebRTC Firewall. version two. <laughs> this presentation was somewhat simplified by Alan Johnson's presentation, so thank you very much, Alan. Um, <laughs> next slide, please. Um, so look, we, we have a, a, a long history of uh, firewalls making authorization decisions about what's allowed by looking at what the application is. They might look at the application in a silly sort of way, just use the port number to try and determine applications in the simplest cases. They look at slightly more advanced things some point in time. Uh, and many administrators use that to try and decide to allow things. I'm trying to get it so that we can get WebRTC working over UDP. That's always a sort of best case scenario for us versus various types of tunnels. Um, and uh, this, this, this fully, you know, the, the administrators inside fully understand that applications can lie. That's fine. They can lie about this and carry on as always. People deal with that by making sure they understand what type of applications people are installing on their, on their computers. But we're not trying to solve that problem. Um, so next slide, please. So, you know, the proposed solution here is um, only send, is, is Alan, Alan's number one proposal. Only send the origin when they match. What do you know? <laughs> That's a good solution. Um, and by match, um, the web origin includes the port and whether it's HTTP or HTTPS. Obviously, that doesn't make any sense to be sort of ignoring that um, and, and just matching the, the domain name type stuff. Um, I think that this would... Uh, you know, if you're if you're looking for this on the outbound down servers, and you sort of replace the sort of zero version one version of this firewall, ignore the text that's in the firewall version draft, and think about replacing. I mean, there it just said they send the origin on everything, right? Which um, was overly broad and and has the same problem that Alyssa raised. Uh, but I, I think that this would that the whole solution would still work just as well constrained like this. Um, it would require that. If somebody was running a white box service provider with, and they're going to host a hundred different domains, all you know, with um, C names that refer to the same place, yeah, they'd have to enter SRV records for those hundred different domains, all pointing at the same turn server too, or group of turn servers. But those turn servers would, um, they'd get the origin, know which one they are processing, know which set of credentials to do. So I think it'd work reasonably well. So that's it. That's my last slide, Eckert. So I apologize for missing the earlier. Um Part of this Alan's presentation, I was unfortunately doing something else. Um, um, can someone recap for me in 30 seconds what the advantage of only sending it to the turn server that, that has a matching domain name is? Hey, Alan, want to come join me? <laughs> um, roughly speaking, it was similar to the argument you made the other day of like, 
you know, you're, you're sending it to your application or some, a, a set of app, the turn server and the web server are clearly in the same sort of trust domain now. You're only sending it to a turn server that already knew you were effectively using that application or the same administrative domain name. But, yeah. Alan Johnson, yeah, the, the goal is to not generate metadata basically. So if it's your application and your turn server, you already know you're using it. So you're not telling yourself anything new that you didn't already know. Right. So, I mean, I guess, I guess my impression was the concern about this, this field I, I'm not taking a position on whether that, whether that is, whether that is it an important concern or not. But my impression of concern at this field was about passive inspection by other network elements who were able to see which, which, which origin you're going to. Okay, so, 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 so that, that's, that was the concern I've, I've heard people raise, um, but perhaps it's not the concern that actually is, is an important concern. I mean, that is a concern that was raised. I thought people generally were not super uncomfortable with it because DNS already kind of leaks this information already. Um, but it is a concern because, like, you know, there's DNS proposals that try to clamp this down. The main thing I'm concerned about here, though, is that if we use, like, DTLS, like, the firewall won't see it. And so, I, like, yeah, let's get to that. So, I, I mean, I, I think with DTLS, what I want to say is that the DTLS used SNI. I mean, the TLS in the same way we use. But aren't, is, aren't we fixing that to, like, not leak the SNI stuff? We're working on it. Look, it, but, but here's, this is, this is the thing that I think is actually totally right about that. Okay, that's a very big decision, much broader on the internet, right, as a whole. True. And this, this exactly fate shares it with it, which is probably exactly what we want to have happen. If we decide in the broad web context to keep SNI there, this thing will still have SNI in the same way. If we decide in the broad web context to kill SNI for TLS, this will disappear as a functional element at exactly the same time with probably the same outcome as everything else. So I, that, the fact that we are probably, you know, that there's people going that direction and we're thinking about that and these two are fate shared, just seems fine to me. So, so why do we need origin though, if we're going to have SNI or the exact DNS name that's going to be used to connect to the turn server? What, what else is origin providing? But origin is SNI for when you're not using DTLS. Right, and I get it. Yeah, so, you, but is is host in the stun packet? Not um, as an IP address, as a DNS name. I'm not currently. I'm saying define it. Basically, throw away origin, you know, stun origin okay, entirely, but replace all it with stun host. Given the constraint I have as my proposal here, those two are exactly the same thing. All you're changing is option 53, previously known as option, is now known as host, but it's it still has the same data in it. It's exactly the same. It's a change without a difference. Well, I mean, except that it means that no matter. Well, it, well I mean, it, the difference is that I would say that host, maybe you don't have this, you know, you know, forget anything about where that came from, always send host. Basically, tell, I, I know, it's basically like SNI. It is literally SNI for stun. No matter who, why I'm sending this turn request, I'm letting you know what name I looked up to get you to find your server. Uh, fair enough. And if Ecker thinks that's a better way to think about it, that, that works for me. I don't really care. Jonathan, what would happen in that case where uh, the actual turn URI was just an IP address? Yeah, okay. <laughs> Can you say that again? I'm after? saying that the, the rule you're proposing here, if the if the if this if the turn server provides an IP address, the rule you're proposing here would require aligning this this attribute because. Then the or because the origin uh, 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 IP address origin is not the same as a as a, as a symbolic origin. So I mean I mean I'm saying that like you would have to modify this rule if you wanted to send this field if you had an IP address. For sure. But I mean from the point that I'm trying to drive this firewall traversal, if we had a host name, if we always sent the host name regardless of whether it matched the origin, that would solve this problem. If we sent the origin name when the host name matched the origin, that would solve the problem as well. Well, I guess, I guess what I'm saying is is that. In the case Justin's indicating, if you have a, if you have a situation, say you have this following situation where you have a um, you have a uh, uh, www.example.com www.example.com origin, and then a um, and then a uh, an IP address in the in the turn server that happens to actually be the number you the address you get when you resolve www.example.com, um, you um, you know you won't get um, then you wouldn't send the origin attribute. 
Um, I mean, that's acceptable. The other thing I want to mention acceptable. is that I'm, is that my experience has been that almost nobody has the same um, turn server names as, um, has the same turn server names as the website addresses. And so, um, and so, and so, and so that means that, that this will not actually work unless people are going to make special, special accommodations on their site. And what I'm wondering about is if we're asking people to make special accommodations on their site, maybe there's some other thing we could do that would not be as privacy leaking that, that, that would, that would, that would solve, that would solve that would the same use case. I mean, my point is like, so I mean, you know, um, apprtc.appspot.com uses stun.l.google.com. And so now Justin's gonna have to make an SRV record. Like, can't we just say else instead of, instead of, instead of that? Like once, once he's got to make an adjustment anyway? Well, I, I, I understand that, but, he, uh, but the key thing to me is only had to make a, an adjustment in SRV in DNS, not to change any of the software he was running. Right, that's, well, that's I mean, the bright line for me, right? Or, or that's a big difference. Well, I mean, except that ever when, when you say change the software, you mean like the fact, except for the fact that all the browsers have to change because none, none of them do this, right? Yeah, I mean, who would actually look up the SRV record? The, the, the browser's already required to look up the SRV record, right? I doubt they do it. Like, if I get an IP address for like the the, in the stun URI, like, why would I look up an SRV record? No, he means he means if you have I, if you I have believe a, the, the stun name. URI draft requires you to look up an SRV URI, right? No, not if it's fully qualified, meaning it's got transport, host, and port supplied. Yeah, sure. And if it doesn't? Well, yeah, then you have to. But I'm like, you know, most people, because they want to be fast, are going to provide the fully qualified URI. Oh, okay, so, you know, that wouldn't work for those, right? I, yeah. Well, I mean, so, it's, it's a DNS. You don't have to do any DNS. So, you know, I, 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 I mean, I guess, I guess what, 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 I would, what, what I would suggest is, I mean, I guess I'm just trying to figure out what the, what the constraints are here. So, I mean, is that it seems to me that, like, that this solution requires everybody to change their, their browsers and then it's not its turn implementations, I mean, which is not necessarily bad. And it requires everybody to change their website configurations. And and in the service of basically telling the in terms in terms, in terms of in service of basically telling the firewall, um, under some conditions, I am a calling service with the following with the following address. I'm just wondering, is there other way I can tell the firewall this that, that might have that, that, that might require less changes or I don't I don't know, right? I mean, I'm just thinking like, there's a lot of changes here and it's in the service saying very small, very very not, not important, but trivial. So we have four minutes. So please be very concise. We are cutting the lines and, uh, and four minutes. So I agree with Eric. And then I'm just very concerned about this general backdrop of privacy that we're kind of contemplating here at the ITF of like, I don't want to spend a lot of, we've already spent a lot of work on origin. I don't want to go push another rock uphill if it turns out that the ITF is going to go against SNI and go against providing this metadata. Alisa? Yeah, so I was going to say, go make your fate sharing argument to the other person who has a discuss on the other document and see how that goes and then you'll get a good indication of uh what justin whether we should be worried about that or not i think who, who is it Steph? Steven. <laughs> uh brandon williams akamai um i'm i'm a little bit confused by the presentation um because it doesn't seem to have any relationship um in in, in terms of problem solution to what your draft was attempting to solve it and it it seems to not be solving the same problem um and so so i don't think you're meeting the requirements that were laid out in the draft and maybe that was intentional um but to to put this into context it, it would have been much more helpful to to have sort of the differential in the requirement set um specifically your your draft called out uh, uh what I interpreted as uh, a desire to not require a turn server um, in order to traverse the firewall. Um, this solution uh, seems to be requiring a turn server in cases that your earlier proposal did not. And, and in, in both cases, I have concerns about completeness and handling all the various different um, problem cases, but this seems to be solving for a distinctly different problem than your earlier proposal was. Okay, so um, let's take this offline update. Yep. One of the things is my earlier proposal was deeply flawed in the 00, zero draft. I actually put out a zero, 01 draft on Monday, which is I would not expect anyone in the room to read for. Right. <laughs> right. Um, but let's let's work through that and, and, yep. and deal with it. And on, on that one, it does require a turn server to get it, or at least a stun server outside the network to get it to work. 
but it can still work with the media not flowing through the turn server, even mm -hmm. with this type of solution. So let's update the draft, and then we, it'll be easier to actually see if it. All right. It, 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 it's, it's very difficult to assess what you've got here in the absence of a requirement set that appears to apply to it. I should write a draft. That's a very fair comment. I agree. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I, I thank agree. you. We'll, we'll get it sorted out. Okay. Thank you. I think you got the, the input you needed. Um, if there's nothing else, we will wrap up at this point. Thank you for coming and enjoy the social.